All right, great. So let's get started. Um, thank you, uh, everyone, for coming along to this webinar uh, titled Unlock the Potential of Secondary Data for, uh, from Clinical Trials with Health Data Australia. Uh, my name is Kristen Kang. I'm a program manager at the ARDC. Uh, and I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. Um, I'm currently on Wajak Luna land, uh, the very, very flat uh, sandy plains over in Western Australia. Uh, I'm normally uh, in the um, uh, more elevated and uh, hilly uh, Ngunnawal land in the ACT. Uh, it's a privilege to be here on the traditional lands of the uh, Wajak Noongar people, and I pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. Uh, so in today's session, uh, we're here to give an overview and some case studies of the kinds of research, uh, specifically secondary research, that can be done with clinical trials data. Um, I'm only going to be talking for a few minutes, thank goodness, and giving you a brief introduction to this new platform called Health Data Australia, which can give researchers access to clinical trials data. Uh, I'm then going to be very quickly handing over to a bunch of great researchers uh, to take you through the kinds of uh, the kinds of secondary research that can be done with clinical trials data and some uh, case studies uh, of the work that can be done. Um, so looking in particular uh, areas of evidence synthesis, secondary analysis, reproducibility, replication and validation, uh, and education, training and learning. After we've heard from our speakers today, uh, we'll then have a short Q&A at the end of the session. So just a, a minute or two quickly at the start to explain what is Health Data Australia. So here are some screenshots of this uh, website that we've built called Health Data Australia. Uh, it is an online data catalog of clinical trials data uh, that's being collected and held by researchers in Australia. Most of you have used the internet and use online catalogs. If you jump into the catalog, you'll see, uh, now this is a bit of an old screenshot. I think we're currently up to about 190 odd uh, data sets in our catalog. Um, so each one of these items here is a data set from a clinical trial. And if you click into one of the records, you'll see uh, some information about that data set, uh, where it's from, who collected it, what kind of data it contains. Uh, I might just go back one screen. You can see here there's an access the data button. So uh, anyone can come along and browse uh, in the catalog. If you click the access the data button, uh, you're then asked to uh, sign into the platform and complete a data request form. When you complete this data request form, it's going to get sent back to the clinical trial or their nominated custodian to review that request and decide whether it's appropriate for you to have access or not. So who are the clinical trials and the custodians that we're working with? Well, we've built a national network, what we call our node network. There are nine nodes and they're based around uh, Australia uh, in most states and territories. Uh, and we have two specialist nodes, one in cancer trials and one in mental health trials. Collectively, uh, those nodes provide coverage across uh, over 70 organisations that run clinical trials in Australia. So uh, close to half the universities in Australia, number of MRIs, health services, clinical trial networks and others. This whole platform and this whole endeavor uh, is being conducted by the ARDC as part of a portfolio of infrastructure development uh, called the People Research Data Commons. So that's basically a program of work uh, that's there to build infrastructure to help the health research community in Australia uh, with the ultimate goal of trying to support research translation and improve health outcomes for the Australian population. So that's the brief spiel about the platform uh, and the kind of starting point of why we're here today. But the actual main point of today's uh, session isn't to talk about data platforms or ARDC or infrastructure. It's actually to talk about research 
and specifically what kinds of research can be done with existing clinical trials data. So you might be someone that is uh, already using clinical trial data to do secondary research and want to hear what other people are doing. Uh, it might be a new area for you uh, and you just want to get your foot in the door and, and see uh, what kinds of stuff you could add into your own research portfolio. Um, or maybe you're doing some of this work uh, and uh, in one particular area want to learn about the other kinds of ways you could be using data, or maybe you're the clinical trial that has the data uh, and wondering, well, if I share my data, what kinds of collaborations could I um, undertake with this? What kinds of additional things could I be involved with just by collaborating with people outside of my group? So that's really what we're going to be um, focusing on today. A few things before we get started. So we're going to hear from uh, a number of speakers over uh, the remainder of the hour. Um, we'll have a QA and a session at the end, so please pop your um, uh, questions in the Q&A uh, box and we'll, we'll get to them later in the session. Uh, but as our presenters today are speaking to you, I'd like to uh, ask you to think about a few things uh, you know, as they're speaking. Is there secondary research that you're doing that you want to showcase? So we're really here today to kind of learn a bit about secondary research secondary research and showcase it. Um, we'd like to hold more of these events in the future. So if you're interested in that, uh, have a think about that and get in touch with us. Also, we've built this uh, data catalog and platform. Um, we're building more tools and resources and we want to improve the data catalog and platform. So we want to hear from you how we can really uh, build these things to make sure it works for you. Uh, and this session today is really our first step in building a research community, and we'd love you to be a part of it. So uh, I'm going to leave it there for the moment and hand over to our first speakers. So uh, I'm going to stop sharing screen for a moment. So our first speakers today are Dr. Annalena Seidler and Dr. Kylie Hunter. Um, they are the... Uh, now, I'm just reading off very small notes here. Uh, senior Research Fellow and Research Fellow uh, based out of Sydney Uni, but they are the co-convener and associate convener of the Cochrane Prospective Meta-Analysis Methods Group. So I think I'm heading over to Lena first. Um, thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Christian. And I'll now be talking um, to you about a few different scenarios for using your secondary research. Um, and then we'll also have some guest speakers and some great case studies. Um, if you want to jump to the next slide, Kylie. So these are the four different scenarios of secondary research that we're talking you through today. And you can see that underneath each of these scenarios um, are a lot more different categories. So we tried to categorize that a bit for you. Um, so we have evidence synthesis, secondary analyses, reproducibility, replication, validation, and education, training, and learning. Um, and if you now think that's maybe way too much for an hour, you're right. So um, we are we have also um, developed a detailed guide on each scenario and resources on that, um, and that will all be shared with you. You can see here all the different questions that are answered there. So that's why today is really just a bit more of a brief overview of the different scenarios that are out there and some examples, and then there'll be more detailed guidance forthcoming. And Kylie will now talk you through the first scenario, evidence synthesis. Kylie, we've just lost your presentation. Sorry, I was just trying to find the unmute button and now you've lost me. Hang on. <laughs> All right, are we back? Yes. Excellent. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm going to talk through the first scenario. Um, that is evidence synthesis, um, which is highlighted here. So what do we mean by evidence synthesis? Well, that is a comprehensive compilation of data across studies with the aim to answer a specific research question. So that data could be in the form of aggregate data, so summarized across participants, or it could be individual participant data, which is raw um, line by line data that's pictured here. So what are some examples of evidence synthesis research questions? Um, you can answer, uh, evaluate the effectiveness of healthcare interventions, and we have um, a case study being presented on that 
uh, very shortly. Then we, you can also examine the role of biomarkers such as molecular and genetic factors um, on the effectiveness of interventions, so individual level subgroup analyses. You can also conduct trial level subgroup analyses where you look at the role of settings and patient populations or intervention characteristics on intervention effectiveness. So lots of different uh, types of research questions that can be answered via this approach. So what are the steps that are required to perform an evidence synthesis analysis? Well, I'm not going to go through them all today, um, but just they're listed here. And I just wanted to draw your attention, first of all, to um, this textbook here, which is a really fantastic guide um, to conducting individual participant data meta-analysis in particular. And I should mention that individual participant data meta-analysis is the gold standard. So that's what um, we focus on mostly when we talk about this scenario. And the other thing I wanted to point out was um, the really highlight the importance of a systematic search for evidence synthesis. So the aim is you want to try and include all eligible trials. And in order to identify these trials, you um, should systematically search uh, medical databases and clinical trials registries. So um, how do you retrieve all the data for these studies? Well, as a first point of call, um, Hassander's Health Data Australia platform um, is a great place for Australian trials that are registered on ANZCTR um, or clinicaltrials.gov. Um, however, uh, because uh, to, to identify data for other studies that are international or unregistered, you will need to also explore other avenues. So perhaps contacting study authors or um, checking data repositories. So there are several advantages um, to conducting individual participant data meta-analysis. Like I said, it's uh, regarded as the gold standard for meta-analyses um, for several reasons. So uh, you tend to have greater data availability um, because you can access often data that might not be re reported in publications. Um, and this leads to more powerful analyses. It also enables more rigorous checking of data quality and integrity. You can harmonize variables and in particular outcome definitions and cutoff points across studies, which can be really useful. Um, and as I alluded to before, it allows more complex analyses. So you can uh, do subgroup analyses that aren't subject to ecological bias. So we've got a little um, figure here, I guess, to show what we mean. So with a a traditional aggregate data meta-analysis um, where you have summary data, uh, you've got all these diverse participants, but that is all then summarized in publications and meta-analyzed to give an average effect estimate. So this gray person here. So whereas with an IPD meta-analysis, um, you can maintain that diversity and color um, in your analyses by looking at the individual specific uh, data. And just a couple of key considerations. So um, uh, IPD meta-analyses can be quite time consuming as you can imagine checking and um, processing, obtaining all the data um, can be quite a process. And sometimes, um, you know, when you're contacting investigators, they might not respond or they may have um, lost the data. But overall, I think the key points are, you know, you properly plan um, the study, you have, make sure you have adequate expertise. And this can be um, a very advantageous approach, as you'll see shortly in our case study. So just quickly, um, Lena did uh, refer to the user guide before. So in, in, we just wanted to let you know that in the user guide, we do have summary tables like this, um, where you can get a brief overview of each scenario. All right, so I'll now hand over to Dr. Sol Liebsman um, to take us through our Case scenario, uh, case study for scenario one. Okay. <laughs> hey everyone. Sorry, just frantically subbing in from another desk. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna be presenting a case study on the ICOM project, something we recently finished. That was a big project of our team, and I'll give you a little bit of background first. So during birth, babies need to transition from being sustained by the placental cord to filling their lungs with oxygen and a cascade of other physiological changes. So this transition can be dangerous and babies born preterm are at greater risk of mortality and morbidity. Oh, what do I do? 
It's fine. It just goes by. Okay. <laughs> uh, the transition out of fetal life during childbirth is influenced by the core cramping strategy. And throughout the latter half of the 20th century, it was routine to perform immediate core cramping, so the clamp within 15 seconds. Um, but evidence has been accumu accumulating, supporting a range of alternate umbilical cord strategies. And a problem has been that previous reviews haven't determined which cord, cord management strategy works best and for which subgroups. So what do we do? Do we wait a minute? Do we wait several minutes? Do we milk the cord? And are certain methods dangerous for subgroups, such as extremely preterm babies? So yeah, traditional systematic reviews and single trials have been unable to find conclusive answers. And hurdles to the finding such conclusive answers have been heterogeneity, trials not reporting all outcomes, and trials including different groups of infants. Well, those are some of the hurdles anyway. So what's a possible solution, including IPD in a meta-analysis? And that's where our ICOM project was born. It stands for an individual participant data on cord management at preterm birth. And our aims were to compare and evaluate effective um, cord management strategies and to identify if managing, uh, these strategies were effective, more or less effective for subgroups. What was the added value of IPD in ICOM? Um, as Kylie already touched on, we included unreported data from trial registries. We examined data integrity. We harmonized outcomes that were slightly different across studies. And we conducted more precise and complex analyses. And that was doing things like adjusting for prognostic factors, such as gestational birth, adjusting for the clustering of twin outcome data, and examining effect modifiers without ecological bias. And to do this, we needed to source a lot of IPD and we formed a global collaboration. We sourced data from 54 trials across the world, which was a bit of a mammoth effort from our whole team. And what are the key results that kind of came from sourcing all this data? So in our pairwise individual participant meta-analysis, we compared delayed clamping versus immediate clamping. And we found waiting to clamp the cord reduced death by about 30%, an odds ratio of 0 0.68. This was a finding that was deemed to have high certainty. And we also found effect was consistent across di different population groups. So across different gestational ages and multiple births, so single or twin. Um, and what were some of the advantages of IPD here? So greater data harmonization and availability allowed for a high certainty of evidence. And there's been a big emphasis in precision medicine and looking at subgroups lately. And we kind of determined that the same intervention was likely consistent across different populations by looking at effect modifiers. Um, we also found kind of interestingly that delaying clamping increased the risk, increased the odds of getting hypothermia. And this was the first study to show an increased risk of an adverse event for delaying. And it's manageable, but it's important to know about and an advantage of IPD here is we gained extra adverse event data that enabled us to analyze rare but important safety outcomes, or maybe not so rare in this case, but hard to attain in aggregate meta-analysis. Um, but the question remained, how long should we wait to clamp the cord? And we followed the previous analysis with study two, a network meta-analysis that simultaneously compared five different intervention categories. And here of note, we split deferral into short deferral, medium deferral, where the delay was slightly longer and a long deferral, where the delay was 120 seconds plus, the longest delay. And in this network meta-analysis, we found that long deferral reduced death before discharge the most. So uh, a long deferral of cord clamping reduced the risk of mortality by about 70%, which is a huge effect compared to um, immediate cord clamping. And what's more, compared to every other intervention condition, there was a 91% probability of it being the best treatment. We also found that gestational age did not modify the effect of treatment. So IPD here allowed a granular comparison of different core clamping techniques for the first time. In summary, across these two studies, we found that deferred core clamping reduced mortalities for babies born preterm. The effect was consistent for different population groups, that is, across different gestational ages, and whether they were multiple birth or singleton. Um, we also found that deferring more than 120 seconds led to the largest reduction in mortality, 
Uh, and finally, we found that adverse effects of hypothermia increased with delaying and it underscored the importance of providing immediate care. And so IPD meta-analyses had these kind of key conclusions. And I guess the takeaway is they were all facilitated by data sharing. And our final product were two Lancet publications from this that really kind of demonstrate that this kind of work is valued and can have high impacts. And I will pass on to the next presenter. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sol, um, for showing us a great case study of how secondary data can um, lead to so much impact. And maybe also important to note that all the people that shared data ended up being co-authors on these Lancet publications. So hopefully everyone profited from working together here. Um, we're now moving on to the second scenario, um, secondary analyses, where existing data sets are used um, in different ways that are not evidence synthesis to answer new research questions and so on. Um, Kylie, do you want to put me to the next slide? So what is a secondary analysis? Um, in the secondary analysis, existing data sets are used to answer a new research question. So whilst evidence synthesis, we are often answering the same research question, but with more data and more statistical power, um, a secondary analysis is using an existing data set to try to address something new. And this is quite a broad category. So it can include lots of different research questions, such as descriptive analyses, and maybe health economic assessments, um, product, prognostic or predictive analyses. You may use it for power calculations for future trials, um, or maybe to conduct some exploratory analysis. Now, um, one of the key differences between the secondary analysis and evidence synthesis is that you don't need to find all eligible data sets for this. So you can just use one or a few data sets. The steps to perform a secondary analysis are very much that of most research projects, even though it's important to say it does depend. So usually you develop a protocol and then obtain data, um, important to process and check data carefully, conduct your analysis and disseminate. However, for an exploratory analysis, maybe your protocol is a little bit less detailed than for a hypothesis confirming that. Um, now, what data sources do I need for my secondary analysis? Like I've already outlined, this is a key difference to evidence synthesis, and this is where Health Data Australia may be really useful because you can use a convenient sample of one or multiple studies, so it doesn't need to be all eligible studies. Now, what's important about secondary analysis is to really think about the generalizability of your data. So is it um, representative to the population that you're interested in? And again, this depends a little bit on the research question. So if I'm interested in um, description, then I need to be aware that the data I'm analyzing may be very specific of that trial. So ideally, I want some kind of sample that's representative of the population, such as a whole of population trial. If I don't have that, I really need to think about those limitations. Um, with health economic assessments, very much need studies that actually have the relevant data for these assessments and so on. And same for identification of prognostic or predictive factors. I need to think about um, whether the studies are measuring the factors or outcomes of interest. So if you give me the next slide, Kelly. Um, so while secondary analyses are really great um, if we have the right data and generalizability because they can increase the utility of our original data and reduce research waste, we're able to answer new research questions without having to go back and collect data. Um, we do really need to consider whether the data we are using are appropriate for our research question at hand and whether the data sets are generalizable. Um, again, we have um, a little summary table here that I won't walk you through in detail, but just to show you this is an additional resource that is coming your way. Um, but for now, I'd like to hand over to our second case study um, to present. So to Dr. Angelina Chakovidaya, oh my God, Chakovidaya, I did practice this before, but it is um, early morning for me here in Europe. Um, so sorry, mate, um, who um, is a CPC Future Leader Research Fellow and a medical oncologist. And she'll now show us a great case study of secondary analyses. 
Thanks, Lenny. Uh, I have to um, agree that my last name is not the easiest one. So um, I'm here to talk about our case study for secondary analysis. And our case study uh, addressed a new research question. So I was able to uh, pull data from four primary studies, as you can see here, that looked at a new treatment, um, an uh, oral targeted PARP inhibitor therapy as maintenance for women with relapsed ovarian cancer following response to chemotherapy. And as you can see, um, these are studies published in the Lancet Medgem. And these studies um, were landmark. If we can have the next slide. Um, they established these PARP inhibitors as a new standard of care. Um, as you can see with these uh, progression-free survival curves, you can put a train um, in between those tracks. Um, and although they answered the treatment question, um, the research question that remained unanswered was how do we best monitor women uh, to detect cancer growth on this new treatment? So if we can have the ne next slide. So uh, as some of you may be aware, um, in women with ovarian cancer, we use a blood tumor marker called CA125 to monitor response and progression. Women typically uh, are followed up in clinic and we assess their symptoms and signs, as well as a blood test, including CA125. And if there's concerns um, in regards to this clinical assessment or a rise in CA125, then we're prompted to um, arrange for CT or PET imaging. And this is in contrast to other solid tumors and clinical trials where routine CT imaging um, is done to detect cancer growth. Um, of note, the CA125 criteria for progression were developed in the setting of chemotherapy decades ago. Um, and early detection of cancer growth is important because it allows us as clinicians to discuss um, potentially alternate, more suitable treatments with the patient and see potentially futile therapy and avoid potential toxicities. So our research question is, what is the clinical accuracy of CA125 versus CT imaging criteria to detect cancer progression in these women. What we found was that actually um, pulling the data from these four randomized trials, there was poor concordance between CA125 um, and the CT criteria for cancer progression in women with relapsed ovarian cancer on these treatments. Approximately one in two women um, who had CT detected cancer progression did not have um, the concordant CA125 progression. And most actually had normal um, levels uh, or of CA125 at the time of CT progression. We were able to pull the data and do subgroup analysis. And we found that there were uh, different profiles in regards to sites of progression. So uh, women who had growth, uh, cancer growth around the intestines um, had more of a rise in CA125 versus those who had solitary um, uh, uh, metastases. Um, for example, in the liver or lungs. So ultimately we found that CA125 monitoring alone uh, may not be, uh, is not reliable to detect cancer growth um, and periodic imaging should be considered um, to monitor these women uh, on PARP inhibitor therapy. Uh, our findings um, were practice guiding um, and also um, informed clinical guidelines. So um, whereas before uh, international guidelines recommended um, doing CA125 routinely, uh, this one from the European Society of Medical Oncology now is updated to, to show that um, it's important to include imaging and all the blood markers CA125 when monitoring these patients on these newer treatments. And it certainly informed uh, my practice as well as my colleagues' practice. And as with research, um, new questions arise. So um, we still don't know what is the optimal uh, surveillance strategy. Is it three monthly CT scans, six monthly CT scans? And does that vary by, by risk? Um, so uh, I'm in the process of doing further secondary analysis to answer these new research questions. So in terms of lessons learned, um, I think that uh, as L uh, Lena has um, mentioned, uh, studies often collect a lot of data and randomized controlled trials in particular um, have a whole data set and it's high quality data that can address new questions beyond the primary uh, treatment comparison. Uh, I think that's recognized but underused. Um, and so there is this opportunity to maximize the value of trial data through secondary analysis. Um, the data sharing experience in this case study it took um, over four to five years 
to access the data and it involved um, close collaboration with key stakeholders in the industry. Um, and we had the backing from the Gynecologic Cancer Intergroup um, a meta-analysis committee uh, for this project. Um, so I think that there is scope for trial data sharing initiatives um, to foster further impactful research um, in regards to secondary analysis, as well as streamlining the data sharing process. Thank you. Thanks, Angelina. Uh, that was very interesting. Um, okay, so now we are moving on to scenario three, um, which is reproducibility, replication, and validation. And this is quite an interesting and important scenario because um, I guess as scientists and researchers, one really important thing we need to do is to check and test our hypotheses in a transparent manner. And so this is captured nicely in this quote here by philosopher Karl Popper um, when he says, single occurrences that cannot be reproduced are of no significance to science. And in his theory of falsification, um, he postulates that in order to advance our understanding and knowledge, um, we do that not by proving theories or hypotheses, um, but by rigorously testing and attempting to falsify them. So this is sort of what the premise that underlies um, this scenario. Um, and so these three types of studies, they aim to verify the accuracy, validity, and trustworthiness of scientific findings. Um, so briefly, in a reproducibility study, um, researchers reanalyze existing data from a study using the same methods to see if they get the same result. In a replication study, a researcher will apply the same methods to a different data set, again, to see if the results are comparable. And in validation studies, um, researchers who perhaps find an interesting effect in their trial may want to test that on a new data set to see if it's generalizable across studies. And so I guess traditionally these um, study types were maybe seen as a bit mundane and less prestigious um, than an original research study, but there is definitely an increasing awareness now um, of the need to test our findings to see are they robust um, and do they hold up when tested by others. And that's a really um, positive development in this space that this is increasingly happening. Okay, so um, in terms of the steps required, um, it's really important to have a proper protocol that is transparent, that can be replicated and is understandable by others. Also really important um, is to perform the study in a considered manner, so in respect of the original study authors. So the aim of this is not to point any fingers if you find that, you know, your results are not comparable, but um, it's not about saying someone's done something wrong. It's just does checking if a theory holds up um, so that we can get the best knowledge and advanced science. So um, in terms of data sources, I guess, uh, you know, and another distinction here is you don't need um, data from all eligible studies. You can sort of pick a study that's relevant to your topic. Um, so, and of course, you can get these data sets via um, Health Data Australia, or again, exploring some of the other options here. So ideally for a replication study, you'd, probably, you'd want a similar um, population across studies, but perhaps for a validation study, um, a broader population or various settings um, is better so that you can assess how generalizable findings might be. So um, in terms of the main advantages, it does, um, these studies do foster rigorous and transparent research practices. Um, they enhance confidence and credibility if the research findings are found to be re reproducible and re replicable. And um, they can also enhance generalizability um, and external validity of findings. Um, in terms of uh, key consideration, again, difficulty in obtaining data, but also, I guess, um, difficulty in maintaining research materials, because often to conduct this type of study, you need not just the, the data set itself, but um, details about the specific analysis methods um, undertaken. So, um, you know, ideally, uh, you could reach out to study authors um, for this information, but it's important to keep um, sort of some level of independence um, to maintain 
so that it's valid. Okay, and again, we uh, draw your attention to these nice tables that will be in the user guide. And for this scenario, uh, we did not have time for a case study today, but um, watch this space, there will be many forthcoming. So now I'll hand back to Lena for our last scenario. I suppose you got some philosophy instead of a case study for this one. Exactly. Um, <laughs> So the last scenario is quite an exciting one and it's a little bit different to some of these other ones. It's about education, training and learning here on the right-hand side. And what do we mean by this? Um, so again, this is a somewhat broad domain, but it's using an existing data set to either teach and learn about data cleaning or analysis methods, but it can also be used using data sets to develop and to demonstrate new statistical methods or um, increasingly important to inform machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, what are the steps? And again, I suppose it's quite um, different to some of the other study types we've been looking at. And again, within those categories, it's different as well, but um, it's important to really think about what do you wanna get out of um, using these data sets and then to obtain appropriate data sets and importantly to adhere with regulations. And that's quite different on whether you use the data sets to teach, to train or to learn. Um, what data source? We believe Health Data Australia is an excellent data source um, for this fourth scenario, because at the moment there are a few data sets out there available. For example, there's some in R, but they're just being used over and over again to develop methods and to teach with. So having a bit more diversity of data sets here will be really important. Otherwise, all the traditional paths are also available. So what are the main advantages? I think anyone who's taught statistical methods before or dealt with real data compared to made up data knows that it is so different looking at a real data set and it enables us to learn so much more. There are all these little mistakes and inconsistencies that just don't happen in a made up data set. So I think it really does improve the capacity among students and researchers to learn about data analysis and data management. It also generally supports methods development and learning. So similarly, and we'll hear a great case study there, we're developing or testing statistical methods, having a real data set to do so is so much more valuable than a made up one. However, it's important to really obtain the appropriate data for your purpose, and particularly when you're using data sets for teaching or for informing machine learning, really thinking about how to protect participant privacy. You don't want to share a delicate data set with your students. So either you may really think about how to de-identify and anonymize much more than you would in another study, or you may even be using methods such as looking at servers that students can access just to analyze these data, but they can't download the data, for example. So it's really important to think about the data set you're using and how to be most appropriate around that. Um, and again, we have our lovely table here that uh, is quite full, but just to show you there are more resources for you forthcoming. And we also have a case study for this one that's uh, presented by Dr. Christy Robledo. Thanks, Lena. Um, so when uh, Lena and Kylie reached out for a case study, it was really hard for me to choose from all of those um, options there because I actually use data a lot uh, for teaching as well. But today um, we're going to talk about methods. So uh, first of all, research methodology. So research methodology is how we do our research. Um, methodology, uh, methodological research is about improving the way that we do our research. So there's lots of different areas um, for methodological research. Um, and you can see some of the areas here, and that is not complete at all. Um, there's a lot of work in health economics, um, um, in trial design, et cetera. But today I'm going to be discussing an example from analysis, so methods of data analysis. So why do methodological researchers need data sets? Well, I guess I'm um, definitely putting my statistician hat on now. Um, I'm thinking about from, from my point of view. So 
it's really foundational for developing new methods. So I think that's been touched on already, but, you know, data sets providing um, raw material that is really necessary for new um, methods, particularly in the machine learning space. So when they need access to varied and comprehensive data sets um, and large, diverse, you know, all of those kind of words to both train and to validate their models to making sure they work across a lot of different scenarios scenarios. And then we also need uh, data for validating our methods or benchmarking our methods. So once we do have a new method, we want to know how it compares to other methods in the area, how much better it is, hopefully. Uh, and data sets are really crucial uh, for that benchmarking. So using simulated data is great, but unfortunately we do need um, real case studies because uh, you just can't beat real data. Uh, and that's where we come into our case studies here. So this is really how I'm going to highlight um, data sets that I used for my work. So again, ver variation is key here. We want to use um, a variety of case studies for new methods to be able to show uh, how they work in different clinical areas or different research areas. Um, and that really gets them to gain traction and showcase how they can be used um, in the real world. So um, I was uh, investigating different data sets that I could use for my new method that I developed. And if I just get the first, um, yes. So I was looking for data sets like this. So I think Lena touched on before, we want sometimes want very specific examples. So what I developed was um, an algorithm that not just looks at what's happening over the average here. So we've got time in seconds down the bottom, and then we've actually got the acceleration um, of a crash dummy's head in a motorcycle accident. This is what that data set is. And that's basically showing you that the mean is changing over time. So you can see like if we put all the plot points together at a time, it's it's changing, but also the variability of that data is changing. So it's quite tight at the start and then goes very varied as it goes down and then comes up and gets really varied there. And then it comes kind of back together again at the end. So my method was looking at analyzing not just what's happening in the mean, but also in the variance. So the second data set was uh, a LIDAR data set. So it's a light experiment that's been conducted to measure distance. Uh, and the, again, that's happening over a range of distances. So these are both two very classic and very well used data sets in the space of variance regression, uh, which is where the new algorithm that I developed sits. Uh, and they're both publicly available. So you can go online and Google LIDAR data set or motorcycle crash data set, and you can pretty much get a hit for the Excel data set, or it actually sits in R for a few, um, a few different packages. Um, and it's even on the front cover of a textbook. Um, so that I think that's pretty cool that, you know, someone's data set from the 1960s is now on the front cover of a data set, uh, a, you know, stats textbook, which I'm sure is very well loved by a lot of students. So these are some of the outputs that you can get from my algorithm. I'm not going to talk too much stats um, at you, but basically my algorithm performed quite well. I was very happy. I was able to model um, not just the mean, which is those, um, those ones in red is the mean over time, but I was also able to model the variability. And uh, those relationships were very flexible relationships. So you can see lots of curving and changing over there um, as, as the data changed in both the mean and the variance so um and for those of you that know anything about um you know stats 101 and assumptions we've got some nice looking normal residuals down there which i was very happy with so just having those case studies is really important to highlight in methods papers um, that your method does work and it doesn't stop just there, as Angelina was talking about before, um, now looking for kind of more contemporary clinical examples um, of, you know, variability of biomarkers that could be investigated by applying this new algorithm, um, for example, blood pressure and cardiovascular disease. But I think I might leave it there. Um, I'm sure everyone has lots of questions for you guys as well, because it's been a great session. Thanks so much, Christy. And that gets us to the end of us talking. Um, 
our session and I'll be handing back over to Kristen to be moderating the discussion. All right. Thank you so much to all our speakers. Um, what I might do is we're um, transitioning into the final uh, 10 minutes or so of this webinar today and into the Q&A. Um, I'll ask uh, the attendees if you'd like to pop questions into the, uh, I'm not sure if you have access to the chat or at least the, the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, press that, pop your questions in there. Um, we are using Zoom webinar, so uh, we're a bit restricted in, in uh, letting people uh, unmute uh, and so on. So you need to pop your questions in chat as a starting point. Um, um, I think, Kylie, your screen sharing, if I could ask you to uh, pause your screen sharing and I might just flick over to mine for a bit. Thank you all. Um, and let's see if I can share the right screen this time and not the last thing that I was working on. Um, so yeah, just if people want to start adding questions uh, into the Q&A box, that'd be great. Um, I think one thing that I got from all those talks, and that was a real whirlwind of different research out there, but I think that's exactly the thing that we wanted to present to you all today, um, to really show you all the different kinds of research that uh, can be done with existing clinical trials data. Uh, and if people are sitting there thinking, oh, well, that was a, like a whole lot, then good. I think we've we've achieved our aim there. Um, and so hopefully you've, you've uh, the cog is starting to turn about, well, actually maybe there's new research I can do. Maybe there's some different kind of research that I could be doing. Um, and if you're a trialist uh, that has data um, and you're thinking about, uh, and you're looking at this stuff um, for the first time, maybe you're thinking, oh, I have all this data. Maybe there is something more that can be done with it than beyond just the research that I was doing as my primary question for my trial. Uh, and maybe this is a way to open up new opportunities for collaboration, for uh, publication, to increase the impact of the research that I'm doing. Uh, without having to do another trial or collect any more data. Um, so also just to uh, point you to or remind you of these resources uh, for your research. So we mentioned the Health Data Australia uh, platform. So that's where you can find uh, clinical trials data uh, in Australia. I really did a terrible job at the start of the session of setting up uh, one key thing, which is that uh, the, the diagram that you saw on screen throughout in these four different scenarios and that, that table of information for each of those scenarios, that guidance, uh, this is something that we'll be publishing quite soon um, and we'll let you know about that. So that's really those considerations and a number of these case studies that you heard about today and more. Uh, so if you're considering doing secondary research, there's some guidance for you. Uh, and then the last piece uh, of what we're trying to build here is this community uh, of secondary health researchers. Um, Jen, so can I ask you a question? Because I actually just went to try and ask a question and I can't. Oh, Q&A is not open to me. Um, uh, but how how search, is the search function already up and going on the data set, on the website? Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, so like, for example, if I wanted to look for blood pressure and cardiovascular disease, I could kind of put those two search terms in and it would come back with some hits. Is that kind of the kind of level? Of yeah, exactly. So we have uh, keyword search. Um, so you can do that kind of thing. Uh, you put me on the spot to remind. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's good. Um, you can also search in particular fields within the records themselves, so within the title uh, or the description elsewhere. There's also, um, once you jump into the uh, records view page, they are um, you know, the same as any uh, catalogue site. They've got uh, subcategories, so you know, it might be what subject area, like chemotherapy or, or health surveillance or cancer therapy, uh, it could be on the condition codes, such as mental health or depression. 
uh, and so on. So there are different ways of searching. That is something that we are looking to um, uh, improve over time. And we're doing some work with a, a group over in the UK called HDR UK, uh, who have some pretty fancy tech for doing that. So we're partnering with them uh, to, to learn what they're doing and how we can build it into our system. Okay, um, enough of me talking for a moment. I can see we've got a few questions coming in. The very first question which came in early was, was uh, from a researcher in Nepal, which is very exciting to have someone uh, from overseas and from Nepal um, and uh, wanting to showcase their research um, and uh, incorporate ARDC data into research. So the catalog that we're talking about and maybe someone can pop uh, the link in chat to that would be great. Um, that's where you can start searching for data. Um, in terms of showcasing research, we are going to give you a link uh, fairly soon to a feedback form. So if you were uh, interested in uh, being able to present your research to a group like this, um, yeah, we'll be collecting that information from you after the session. Okay, so then moving on to the next question. Uh, can we synthesize individual data with the analyzed slash published data? Uh, Anna, Lena, jeez, uh, can't read. Lena is going to answer this question live. Lena. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, that's a really good question. And yes, that is possible. And there are a few different ways you can do this. So the first scenario would be that you're actually running an aggregate data uh, meta-analysis based on published information, but then some trials haven't published and you still want to include them. And in that case, you could just, you could access their data and get an effect estimate from them and still include them to have a more complete evidence base. The other thing that you can do is you're running an individual participant data meta-analysis, but you don't obtain data sets from every trial. And again, there, there's some really great methods that you can combine both the individual participant data with the published data, at least for some of the analysis, to see whether it makes a difference. And some of the resources that we'll be sharing will cover that in some more detail as well on how to do that. Okay, thank you so much. Um, moving on now, there was one question from Karen about, you know, we have data, how could we get involved in sharing it? I've responded to that in chat. Um, there will be a link to a feedback form that we'll uh, be sharing with you uh, before the end of the session. You can also just contact us at ARDC. That's something that's uh, easier to have a separate conversation with you directly outside of this session. Um, so next question from Fiki, uh, what can we do as trialists or data managers to make data sets more accessible to other researchers, especially during the startup development stage of new trials? Kylie, you were going to answer. Maybe I'll make a start, but others I'm sure have lots of suggestions. But I was just thinking, um, especially during the startup development, is to look for um, core outcome sets that may be available that you can use to help your data be able to be harmonized and comparable with other studies. And then always, of course, having like a really nice data dictionary um, with intuitive variable names um, and, you know, clearly labeling your coding. So zero equals male, one equals female, um, that type of thing, I think is, um, we've come across all sorts of data sets and um, often, you know, they're not so clear. So I think that's a starting point. Um, Lena and Christy, I imagine, or Sol may want to add to that. I would suggest that you use a data database to collect data. Do not use Excel because that will avoid most of the drama that Kylie's just mentioned in um, capturing all of those issues in one hit. <laughs> and that will also ensure there's a trail for all of the data so that you can clean it. Thanks, guys. Yeah, and look, um, some questions uh, there and... Um, uh, from Karen as well from Western Sydney Uni, really about, you know, actually from the side of the trialists who are setting up trials and, and considering sharing data um, uh, and some great practical advice around uh, using databases and proper uh, data management software and good data practices like keeping good documentation and so on. That's that aspect of I'm a trial considering sharing data and I want to build it into the trial from the start. That's actually what we haven't been talking about today. We normally talk about that 
to no end in these sessions because we they're targeted at um at clinical trialists uh today we wanted to showcase what kind of secondary research you could do uh but the Hassanda program which again I didn't mention at the start so bad on me but that's the name of this particular uh piece of work that we're doing uh, around clinical trials data sharing um we've been working for a few years with all those partners that I showed you before uh on exactly how to do that um, for your trial. So uh, maybe reach out to us via the feedback form or via um, the contact at ardc.edu.au email. Um, also, I can see a good prompt from uh, uh, Jono saying, make sure you mention ethics uh, to share uh, and consent from participants to share when you're uh, doing your data collection, uh, or actually prior to data collection, of course. So yes, that's uh, really important. Um, if you don't have consent, it's quite tricky to share data. It's not impossible. You can get waivers of consent, uh, but that's a whole different route. So making sure you've got that uh, ethics uh, and consent piece in place, really important. We have some resources that can help you with that. Um, we're running out of time, so I'm not going to go into them now. I can't see any more questions, and we're just about at the um, uh, end of the session. So I'm just going to leave you. Don't run away. You've got 30 seconds more. Hang on. Um, so Amani has dropped the, um, uh, the feedback form in chat. Uh, it, it, you don't have to answer everything in there. If you want to showcase your research, um, use that form. If you want to find out more about what we're doing, uh, use that form, get in touch. Just as the last thing before we go. So really hammering home the point here that uh, if you are doing secondary research and you'd like us to showcase your work, as we have done uh, with our partners here at, uh, at Cochrane and uh, based at Sydney Uni and CTC there, um, please be in touch. We want to have more of these kinds of sessions. Uh, also, as you've seen, we're building all these tools and this guidance and these resources. Um, we'd really like your feedback on how to improve them, how to make sure that they're useful to you. And then we're starting to build this community and that's what today is. It's our first step in, in building a, a community of researchers who are working on data together. So please use the form um, to let us know uh, how to get in touch with you, how we can do things better, what you need. Um, and I might leave it there. You can also contact us at the details on screen. Thank you everyone for your time.